Hey everybody, thank you guys so much for joining us today for our webinar on leadership and social work practice. Our presenter today is Chris Rich. Uh, Chris has been practicing social work for over 20 years, currently employed as the coordinator of health services for the elementary division of Milton Hershey School. He has experience working with children and adolescents in a variety of settings, such as inpatient and partial hospital, in-home, and school settings. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology from Messiah College and a Master's of Social Work from Marywood University. He's currently serving as the chair of NASWPA Ethics Committee and was the president of NASWPA board from 2009 to 2011. Uh, he's also an active member of PASSWP, the Pennsylvania Association of School Social Work Personnel. Chris is an adjunct professor at Shippensburg University and Messiah College teaching social work classes. So uh, Chris is very familiar with presenting um, and doing continuing education workshops. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you, Chris. Thanks. All right, Tyler, thank you so much. I really appreciate that uh, very kind introduction and uh, the opportunity to uh, talk to uh, fellow social workers about leadership. Uh, I also want to give a, a special shout out to Tyler Woodcock, who has put so much work into making this happen for NESW members and NESW as well for um, for all the work they do on behalf of social workers, you know, and the clients that we serve. So thank you all for uh, joining us in this uh, Lunch and Learn series. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Uh, as uh, Tyler said, I'm at the uh, Milton Hershey School sitting in my office and uh, able to present to you in your offices or uh, uh, homes or wherever you happen to be now. So. I'm also a very proud NESW member. I wanted to talk about leadership uh, because I see every day that, um, you know, that, that more and more there's a need for social work leadership out there. Our clients, our organizations, our communities, and our society um, need the skills that you all present, and we need to be stepping up as leaders um, in these areas of need. <clears throat> Uh, so we're going to be talking about leadership today. I think um, there's three uh, reasons that I think social workers make great leaders, and, and I wanted to just to kind of highlight that um, and just encourage folks that as they as opportunities come up, you know, for leadership that they that they take advantage of that. Um, I think the first one is our training and systems theory, uh, looking at the whole instead of the individual pieces and how they the all the pieces kind of impact each other. I think that training is unique to us as social workers. I think we could really leverage that, and that gives us a, um, a unique opportunity uh, to use our leadership skills um, to work with our clients and the organizations that we work with that we feel so passionate about. A uh, second thing is um, our commitment to ethical codes and our high practice standards. So, um, you know, other uh, areas of practice have ethical codes, um, and, and to certain different degrees, they uh, you know they implement that. But I think you know, in particular, social worker have a, a high understanding of our ethical responsibilities, um, use that in our practice settings, and um, you know, we can use that, again, to leverage our, our leadership skills and the groups and the people we come in contact with. And lastly, um, our ability to team and collaborate and network with each other. So again, it kind of goes unique to our profession and uh, unique to the skills that we bring. So uh, that teaming, that collaboration, and that network, I think, are, are really important for us to bring forward and, and, um, and use in our leadership experiences. Um, and in this short time, I'd like to talk about uh, leadership and explore three models of leadership. I want to look at um, principle-centered leadership, I want to look at uh, servant leadership, and I want to look at transformational leadership. And just to take a little bit of time to compare those three models and um, get a chance to, to um, talk about some of the skills that each one will develop and um, go from there. So I'd like to start with a little funny quote here, um, so that everybody wants to change the world but nobody wants to change the toilet paper roll. And that is a, a, you know, a, a funny take on a, on a very old saying, but the more I started thinking about it, the more profound that was to me. <clears throat> because when you think about it, there's two p potential scenarios here, right? So uh, the first scenario is that you're the one that used the last of the toilet paper roll. And um, so, you know, you have an obligation to uh, to make sure that that uh, that's refurbished for the for the next person that comes in. So, you know, my first um, thinking about this, as far as kind of how this applies to leadership, is that you know we need to take responsibilities when we cause a problem or when there's something that is in our purview of, of take, need to take care of it, that we take care of that. 
Um, second thing is that we, you know, second scenario is that you come across uh, a situation where there is is not a toilet paper roll in there for the bathroom for somebody else. And so um, we anticipate a problem of fun at somebody else and we fix it, um, even though we weren't the ones that initially caused it. So my second kind of principle in leadership is that, you know, when we come across problems uh, that we can solve for other people, that we take the time to do that. And that when we take care of the little things like a toilet paper roll or the many other little things that happen in our lives, that we can reach our big goal. And that's changing the world that we that we want to have and creating the world that we want to have for our clients, for our communities and um, you know, for our organizations. So leadership is not always about kind of fixing these big goals, but it's taking care of the many small details um, in our lives and our and our uh, clients lives that need to be taken care of in order to get what they need. So, and that fits nicely into the servant leadership model. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of, as you look at yourself as, as leaders and, um, and the, the work that you do, um, you know, a couple of things to kind of keep in mind as far as some overarching strategies and some things that, uh, that you wanna um, be working on here. So, you know, first of all, just kind of looking at it from a career development. So I'm imagining that we have social workers here from, uh, all different kind of uh, walks of life and practice areas um, and all different places along their, their professional development from uh, students to uh, folks that may have um, either be close to retirement or, or retiring. So, but for each step of the way, you're there for a particular purpose. And we look at our careers, you know, it's not just a particular job in a, in a particular social work uh, role right now, but we kind of look at it as overall, overall career development and how we are kind of putting ourselves into positions to be um, in a, that we can influence the, the, our clients the best we can. Um, you know, second skill that I think we all need to develop is determination in the face of adversity. So, um, you know, adversity will come and um, there will be challenges along the way. And that, you know, the determination to being able to stick with the goal, um, you know, despite setbacks is, is one of those key goals that, um, that I think, um, you know, great leaders need to face and need to kind of, um, you know, persevere through, through the challenges as they rise. Um, next area is overcoming skepticism. And I wanted to kind of point out too, not only the skepticism of others, but the skepticism that we have in ourselves. I think sometimes, you know, I see folks kind of hold back or, or even myself, like a hold back, say, yeah, I don't know if I can do that or not. I don't know if that's going to be something that's going to be overwhelming. Um, that um, you know, we take the, the leap of faith to, um, you know, to give it a try. And um, you might find out that, um, that you have more leadership skills than, than you think. One of the things that prompted me to do this was reading um, Cheryl uh, uh, Stanberg's uh, book on um, Lean In, and that's one of her kind of key principles. And I, that's one of, one of the things I wanted to share with you is that, uh, you know, oftentimes you might not feel qualified or might not, you might be second guessing yourself. But, uh, you know, once you step forward, um, you find out that, uh, that, that you can kind of handle some leadership responsibilities that you might have um, not thought you could. Um, Next is you know, developing persuasive skills. So uh, we all need to you know, make sure we're, our point is getting across and that um, you know, we're able to advocate for the things that we feel passionate about. And um, you know, there are lots of different skills to, you know, to, to provide the persuasive um, interventions to, you know, to hopefully see, help, help people see things your way. And um, you know, sometimes it's no one to push, sometimes it's no one to pull, sometimes it's no one to be quiet, and sometimes it's no one to speak up. So, there's lots of skills that we can we can kind of apply to making sure that we're we're getting our point across. Next area they have is the area of delegation, and we'll talk about this a little later in the presentation as well. But this is an area that I put on my growth chart for the uh, for the year as far as kind of things I need to work on. So I'll be speaking to myself as much as I'll be speaking to the uh, audience here as this because uh, this is one area that I I struggle with and that um, you know I'm trying to learn some skills with, and I wanted to share that with you all as well. Next um, area is um, developing our, and articulating a vision. And this will really come out when we talk about trans transformational leadership and that, you know, kind of our vision of the world um, as, we, as we'd like to see it um, is a real important step into helping other people see what can be um, where nothing exists right now. So uh, whether it's a new program, a new way to reach our clients' needs, whether it's a new approach to uh, addressing an old need, um, you know, we need to have that vision and we need to be able to share that with others. And lastly, you know, the um, leadership as a, as a group uh, is, a, is a team sport. 
and that um, you know, we can't do it without the, the work of others. So always making sure that we take the time to thank our teams, to thank uh, folks that um, you know, worked on the project with us and that um, you know, we, we develop an attitude of gratitude uh, for others as, uh, as, as we move about kind of reaching our own goals. So those things kind of are overarching. And again, we're gonna get, in, get into those as we um, look at each of the, the three models. So again, if we take a, a look at the three models, there, there are kind of some, some goals that we could set for ourselves today. Um, and the first is the capacity to distinguish the urgent, the important, the importance and um, the importance of using one's time. So um, as we look at uh, principle-centered leadership, it's really about kind of effective time management and looking at kind of how we we pick our various tasks that we do, how we um, go about doing them, and how we go about um, deciding what we're going to do one thing versus another thing. Developing a personal mastery over discerning what's actually happening versus what's perceived to be happening. So again, it looks at our kind of our, our systems thinking and that um, sometimes is what you what looks like in the surface is much kind of broader than that. So we need to be able to kind of be a little more strategic sometimes about the decisions we make, you know, being able to look at the big picture and um, you're developing that mastery about deciding kind of what's really happening versus what uh, maybe looks like is happening on the, sur on the surface. And lastly, we'll look at some skills um, around servant leadership and then we'll look at um, transformational models as well. All right, so first of all, we'd like to kind of dive into uh, Stephen Covey's model. Um, he calls this principle-centered leadership. And uh, you know, this is, um, you know, we all have the Stephen Covey uh, calendars and um, you know, different uh, paraphernalia that he often will put out. And I think the reason that he did that is because, you know, the time management is such an important kind of part of this model and a, an important part of um, looking at kind of our developing our leadership skills around, um, you know, using understanding our time and being able to use that more effectively so yeah i would encourage you guys to just uh, um, take a little bit of time to do this because i think this is always an interesting activity um, even if you've done it before you know, it takes you know pause some time and really he has four quadrants here and um so the quadrants are pretty simple you know on the uh on the the up and down axis we have things that are not important things that are important um and on the uh the other two axes we have things that are urgent and we have things that are not urgent and so as he you know, divides these four things, you know, look at your daily schedule, look at what you do uh, during your, your, your time um, in any given day and kind of just put them things in, put uh, your, your tasks into these different, uh, these different models. So let's start by talking about the not important. So um, these are things like interruptions, uh, some calls that we get, uh, some mail, some emails that we get, uh, reports that we have to do that that sometimes might not you know go anywhere that they might get sent to somebody but it's not really used for anything important. Um, some meetings that we have we need to look carefully at our meetings. Um, you know we could all have lots of meetings and um, you know if if our meetings are well run and well organized they can be effective. But um, you know I think we can all look at at our schedules and say boy that, that meeting was really not as important. I, I really you know didn't get anything from that. And um, some scrap and rework. So um, again, you might get further along in a project, and you need to you need to kind of start over again. So, you know, again, you find yourself spinning your wheels, and and it's not not important but urgent. So you might have these deadlines to to follow. Um, kind of moving down, we'll move right and talk about things that are not urgent and not important. So um, these are the things that kind of uh, that kind of can can rob our time on a on a daily basis. But um, you know, we really don't gain anything from them. So um, I'll put for myself, uh, you know, browsing Facebook on this on this uh, uh, list there. Um, sometimes we're browsing through uh, news stories or things you can just kind of get caught. You look up and you think, boy, I, I wasted a lot of time in that, and I really didn't get any of my goals done with that. Um, things that are trivial, um, things that we consider to be busy work. Um, again, some mail that we get, some things that take our attention away. Um, you know, these are anything that we've kind of put in that category of time wasters. Um, or even sometimes pleasant activities. So I'm not talking about um, self-care that we need and, and we need to make sure we have time for that. And I would put that into the important category, um, but maybe not urgent. So, um, so we also need to make sure that we're, that we're taking care of ourselves. Okay, moving up, we look at things that are important and urgent. So these would be crises that come up, you know, things that come up every day that have um, kind of pressing deadlines to them. Um, things that um, kind of need to happen on a regular basis. 
Um, these would be you know, things that crises are putting out fires, as I often um, like to refer them to. And um, the uh, the issue with this is that um, if we spend too much of our time in this area, we never get to the important but not urgent. And that um, whenever we look at, at our models, you know, we need to kind of look at um, what we're doing um, down the road. So sometimes if uh, we're looking at prevention instead of crisis management, it takes a little more time. It's not urgent. It's not something that we have pressing right away. But the better we're able to kind of think ahead and start planning out how to avoid those crises and, and kind of putting in, in more preventative care, then the better off we're going to be at being able to address the issues long term. So when we look at kind of what we want to see at your area of maximizing, um, when you're looking at Stephen Covey's model, is that we want to look at kind of spending more of our time in the important but not urgent, because oftentimes the other three categories, the other three quadrants, um, end up eating away our time. And so we, we never have the time to kind of look ahead, start planning new projects, start planning new programs, start, again, looking at um, what we call in, um, in, in our realm here, tier one interventions. So these would be things that would hopefully um, reduce the need for more significant care in the end. So, um, and this is oftentimes a hard sell for ourselves um, because our schedules get so wrapped up in the other three. Um, it's a hard sell for some of our funders sometimes um, you know, that, that the crisis can't be avoided and we have to um, you know, make sure we've put significant resources into that. But then we never kind of look down the line and see what we can do to be preventing some of the problems to begin with. And so, um, you know, the, the leadership model that Covey would, would, uh, would encourage us to do is look in that category and then make a case for you know, how prevention can prevent crisis or how prevention can prevent um, you know, some of the tier two or tier three level um, interventions that we find ourselves spending so much time with. Um, it's, harder to, it's harder to quantify, it's harder to um, um, sometimes make a case for, but, I, but again, if we could kind of focus on those things that, um, that are important but not quite as urgent, you know, then we could start um, you know, forging a path to maybe take care of things in a way that we weren't able to do before. <clears throat> so going on to, to uh, Covey's, Covey's uh, principal center leadership, he really looks at four roles that, um, that leaderships would, would take on. So and as, um, as you think about yourself and your practice and the, uh, and the areas that you have responsibility for, um, you know, just put yourself into, into these four roles and see, again, how you can use these to, um, you know, to continue to build your trust. One of the things I, I like about um, Covey's model is that, um, you know, that we all have the same amount of time, right? So um, each of us have has our work days and our free time um, set up, and it's the same for everybody. But, you know, some people are just able to leverage their time much better than others. And so, you know, when we are able to use time in our favor and be able to kind of you know, get get a control of our calendars and get in control of our our lives. Um, you know, the better off we're going to be to to you know to reach the goals that we have. And a big part of that is setting goals and making sure you set your priorities. Because uh, you know, there's there's a uh, um, Joe Biden said I, I heard a quote once I really liked is that if if everything is important then nothing's important. And that um, when we set our goals we need to make sure we we prioritize what's what's most important to get done. So he developed four um, kind of roles that he sees that um, that Covey sees as far as leadership roles versus in the area of modeling, um, developing trust, inspiring trust in others, creating cooperation, um, and, and establishing what our core values are. So you know, a big part of this is kind of knowing ourselves first and and being able to model um, what we do on a daily basis for folks around us. And that's sometimes the most powerful teacher you can have. Um, next area he would recommend um, us working on is, is uh, pathfinding, um, creating order. Again, kind of being able to look down the road and um, you know, helping our clients, helping our colleagues, uh, helping those folks that we have come in contact with, um, see the path of where we can be going and helping, to people, to helping people to see what, what can be. Um, part of that's establishing ownership of the, of the model that we have. And you're helping people um, invest in, 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 in what your ideas are. Um, the next area he would have would be in the area of aligning. Uh, and this would be creating um, a structure and kind of making sure that you're kind of working alongside others. And so that our work is not um, independent of others. Sometimes when I teach, you know, we sometimes we give group assignments and um, you know, the students um, all hate the group assignments and they think, well, you know, why do I have to be responsible for you know, somebody else's work. Uh, I want to be responsible for my own work. 
and I usually come back to them and talk about you know, that that none of the jobs that I've ever been given, they say, you know, go complete this on your own and come back and then give it to, to us and we'll and we'll consider it done. Everything requires um, alignment and requires to be able to kind of fit into a, a larger system. And so we need to be really good about aligning what our, our goals are with other people that we have contact with, make sure that that it fits into what they're doing and, and that everything fits together. And lastly, he would look at empowering. So, um, you know, making sure that people ha are empowered to make the decisions they have and that, um, you know, we look at unleashing our human potential of others. And so it's not only about our own personal development, but it's about developing others around us, helping them be their best selves and uh, helping us be our best selves as well. So that's essentially the um, the Covey model and a very, very uh, kind of brief um, description of what, what Covey's about. <clears throat> um, two areas of that, uh, that that he would look at as kind of being primary importance. One is developing the capacity to distinguish the urgency from the importance and effectively using one's own time to, um, to set goal, goals and move forward. And then the last uh, thing he would suggest would be developing a, um, a personal mastery of systems thinking that allows the underlying causes of problems and concerns to become the primary focus of leaders. So I highlighted two words there. One is systems thinking. Again, we're, we're well trained in that area. Um, and one is looking at the underlying causes of a problem, not just addressing the, um, the symptoms of a problem, which oftentimes um, we find ourselves doing because of uh, time constraints and uh, resource constraints and other constraints. So those are the the um, you know the core principles in the in the in the Covey model. <clears throat> we'll switch gears a little bit and um, and go into servant leadership. So um, when I look at um, servant when I look at these three models, this is the one that um, resonates most with me. Um, so I like uh, the kind of the principles of servant leadership, and uh, you know, Robert Greenleaf is uh, one of the big proponents of the servant leadership model. And um, his quote is, good leaders uh, must first become good servants. And the idea of that servant leadership is really about uh, creating an influence and creating, building a trust amongst your team uh, that needs to happen um, in order for us to, um, to make the changes we'd like to see. So the, um, the definition of servant leadership is a leadership philosophy in which individual interacts with others, either in a management or fellow employee capacity with the aim of achieving authority rather than power. The authority figure intends um, to promote the well-being of others around him or her. So by promoting the well-being of others, we raise our own influence up and our own um, ability to, to lead others. So um, it's kind of a counter, it's, a, it's a, almost a paradoxical kind of thing is that by raising other people up, you know, we can raise our own um, ability to influence and um, ability to kind of create the change that we'd like to, to do. Some uh, you know big companies that that have embraced the leadership model and um, you know, can be seen um, as successful in part by the way that they um, kind of go about their business. Um, you know things like uh, organizations like Starbucks, uh, Marriott Corporation, the Container Store, um, Southwest Airlines. Um, they all have a, a, a focus on you know taking care of their employees, taking care of um, those that are kind of um, asked to do the jobs they're doing and taking care of their customers and so and that shows in the way that they um, you know that they promote themselves and uh, they provide the uh, services they do and um, you know get the um, again the, the good ratings and get people coming back again is really what it's all about for for them for us um, since most of us aren't in the corporate world um, we can use our servant leadership model to um, leverage those around us to get our goals done and working with the clients that we work with Uh, servant leadership is based on teamwork, on cooperation, on our commitment to our work and our commitment to others, uh, our ethical and caring behavior, and ultimately looking at the long-term trust formation. So this is a really kind of a long-term strategy. So we're not, um, and it's more of a philosophy than it is a, kind of a, a, a eight-step principle of leadership. So um, when you know, we look at, at um, servant leadership, really developing a a philosophy based on on uh, on these principles. Does anybody else uh, besides me look at this list here and see that um, you know that these are oftentimes the quality of social workers? So again, I think this model fits in real nicely with um, what we're doing every day um, in the lives of our clients. 
I can take a little bit of time to look at the um, at the traits of servant leadership. So these would be so if you're going to a, a servant leadership seminar, um, it would really be about developing you know some individual characteristics that um, you know that you can use in your leadership skills. So these are um, what he, what uh, Greenleaf calls ten traits of servant leadership. Again, these would be all things that we would um, that we would you know kind of espouse highly in the in the field of social work. Uh, things like listening, empathy. Uh, healing, um, our own personal awareness of, of those in our team and where others are, um, our ability to um, persuade others, uh, our ability to conceptual, you know, for conceptualization. So our, again, being able to put the big picture together, the pieces together for folks. And also, you know, there's an, um, an art to making things simple. Um, you know, so if we could kind of develop models, the, the better the model, the, the more simple the model, the better it's going to be. So if we can conceptualize something, take all these difficult moving parts that we often find uh, our clients need um, and being able to conceptualize it and put it in a way that um, you know, can be easily digested and picked up by others, um, it's gonna go a long way to, to kind of helping us to create the leadership that we want. Uh, you'll see a, a common thread in all these, it's about developing some foresight. So um, not only taking care of the, um, the daily crisis that we have coming up, but you know, having some foresight about where we wanna go and, and um, you know, creating that vision for where people you know, can be, uh, can be a big uh, step forward into helping people to, you know, to make the change they want. Uh, the issue of stewardship, uh, I think is huge. And, and again, stewardship with our time, stewardship um, with our clients, stewardship with um, you know, the things that we have responsible for. Um, you know, how many um, you know, boards are out there, you know, NESW, uh, PASWAP, and other organizations that I'm involved with, uh, you know, they, they really need good leaders and they need pe people that are kind of have some oversight and be able to, to invest in this. Um, every year, you know, it's always a struggle to get NASW, um, their positions filled for their board. So sometimes they have to really struggle to find um, candidates willing to step forward for these different positions. And so if social work is important to us as a, as a career and as an institution, you know, we need to be able to stand behind that. So, you know, I'd really like to see us get to a point where, you know, these leadership positions are slated you know two or three deep and we have a um you know a decision to make a kind of how to find the best qualified folks and so um we we look at kind of the things that are most important to us are we um putting in the time and energy into supporting those um you know making a commitment so again most of it is just um a, an issue of will so um do we want to, something to happen and we want it to happen bad enough if we're willing to make it a commitment um we can make great things happen and lastly, you know, again, something that we're particularly good at, I think, as social workers, and that's building community. So, um, you know, we look at, again, not only just looking at it from a task standpoint, but we look at kind of when we're a healthy community, we take care of each other, we look out for each other. Um, you know, that creates um, an, a, um, a synergy that, um, that can't be created otherwise. And so um, we take time to, to build that community, which, um, which no doubt does take time. And again, sometimes the other pressing things in our schedule um, doesn't allow for that, but we need to make sure we're not letting um, those other things crowd our, our days so that we get the time to, you know, to, uh, to focus on what we think is most important. <clears throat> All right, so that um, wraps up a quick summary of, um, of the servant leadership model. And uh, we're going we're gonna to switch gears and, and go into um, transformational leadership at this point here. So um, transformational leadership is a particular um, uh, study or st uh, practice of, of leadership. Uh, if anybody read the um, December and January issue of the Social Work Advocates, um, the NASW publication that comes out quarterly, uh, there was a whole, the whole last article was dedicated towards leadership. And I found that to be uh, pretty um, interesting and, and informative and, and um, encouraging that um, you know, they talked about some of the leadership um, opportunities that are coming up that um, NASW and National are doing. Um, Angelo uh, McLean, uh, wrote an excellent article in there about transformational leadership, and that's what um, what resonates most with him. And he was able to share kind of how he sees that in his work at uh, um, you know for NASW. The four things that he identified um, in the article that uh, that was written in the in the Advocate was um, what he called individualized influence, um, inspirational motivation, individualized considerations, and intellectual stimulation. And he felt like those were the four things that social workers brought most to the table um, to create the, the leadership in social work that, um, that he'd like to see. So I think um, you know, the quote 
here in the uh, with the picture here really to me sums up what transformational leadership is all about. And transformational leaders um, don't start by um, denying the world around them. Instead, they describe the future they'd like to create instead. And um, you know, when you think about trans transformational leadership, the way I, I look at this oftentimes, it's a lot like an architect or a, um, a, draft, a draft person. So um, you know, someone's gonna put a building up, you know, we can talk about what that building might look like or what it might, what its functions may be, but it's really someone drawing a picture of what can be being able to communicate that with others and see you know, the vision for you know, where the dories are gonna be, where the windows, where the desks, where the, you know, all the nuts and bolts are gonna be um, that needs to happen before that building ever gets created. And um, you know, transformational leadership is really um, you know, the architect of, of leadership. And that that is somebody kind of creating a picture for somebody of what can be um, being able to describe that or share that in a way that others can kind of buy into it. Um, and then people then can get to the work of building the building um, or building the, um, you know, the, the model of the, uh, you know, the, for your clients or for, for what you're doing. Another quote that I like that comes from the um, transformational leadership uh, model quite a bit is um, if our work is sacred, then so are you. <clears throat> and again, I don't think we think of ourselves like that sometimes, but the work that we do as social workers, the work that we do on behalf of our clients, uh, I would definitely put in the, in the sacred realm. And that um, you know that um, you know that you're sacred too, as far as the work that you do, and that so we need to make sure we honor and cherish that as um, as we look at ourselves and look what we look what we provide every day. So when we look at transformational leadership, um, this model here really sums it up very nicely about kind of what our goals are, what our role is um, to become transformational leaders. First of all, it's developing that strategic vision. So before we even look at ourselves as, as transformational leaders, we need to have our own vision about what we'd like to see happen or what we'd like to see what can be. And so we need to take um, some time to kind of sit down and um, do some introspection and develop what our own personal vision is um, and develop our own, um, you know, our, our vision for, you know, organization, for our uh, community, for our clients that we work with. And that once we have that vision down, then it's a matter of being able to share with it, share with our share our vision with others. So the second part of that, so we're working kind of our top down to the right. Um, we need to be able to communicate that vision then. So um, once we've developed our our own personal vision, we need to um, you know to communicate it. And um, oftentimes, what one of my colleagues here is that uh, we you know say it loud, say it often, and say it frequently. And um, so we may feel like a broken record. And um, you know, and if that's the case, and then you're probably getting your word out there because um, you know people need to hear the message more than one time. And that if we're able to constantly communicate what our vision is, and people are able to see and hear that, um, you know, sooner or later, you know, they can start picking up with that. And um, you know, it also means the different kind of groups that we come in contact with. So um, you know, so each of us have different roles in our in our professional and our personal lives. And we need to make sure that we have a vision for each of those areas and make sure that um, you know, all the uh, contributors have a chance to see what our vision are. So um, this would be for, from our clients, to our colleagues, to our funding sources, to our um, you know, kind of the larger community. And that um, you know, oftentimes what, you know, what goes on in our work every day is not seen by the community at large. So we need to make sure we're communicating you know, who we're working with, why we're working with them, why that's important, and um, what would happen if you know someone weren't looking after the particular need that we have? So that communicating of our vision is is so critical in our work every day. <clears throat> um, you know, next, kind of moving down to the to the bottom axis there, it's being able to model the vision. So um, again, kind of um, walking the walk and and talking the talk as well. So we need to be good models uh, for what we're um, what our vision is and what we'd like to see done, and that people again, becomes a very powerful uh, leadership model and being able to model what we do. And lastly, their, their goal would be to building a um, commitment to the vision. So um, we don't kind of hop on the, the newest idea of the day, um, or if our ideas are challenged that we don't give up on them or, or kind of tear them or, or water them down or um, the many other things that can happen along the way that we build a commitment to the vision and that we kind of see it through. So um, you know, that persistence, you know, in, in my career over time, you know, I've seen really that to be kind of the one of those key um, 
uh, qualities that people have. So if someone's persistent enough with their idea, that sooner or later that um, others are going to relent and they're going to give in to you. So um, you know, when we can when we continue to build that commitment that this is our vision and that this is what we're going to see through, um, that usually wins the day. Part of all three of these models have in common, and and part of any um, any leadership um, would have to be in um, developing good communication skills. So I just got a short little video here uh, for your entertainment and um, to have a kind of a launch pad for discussing discussing um, our uh, commitment to good communication. But uh, I'm going to share this with you now. Hopefully, people can view it. For you today. Uh, what's that? All right. Three dinky ones. Uh, would you care for a pastry? Nope. Uh, mocha. Three mocha lattes. Uh, double chocolate chip muffin. Yep. Ah, 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 you have three Paul McCartney CDs. Awesome. And I love the Beatles. They are my life. So good. Assassination. Abraham Lincoln. Uh, uh, you, me, gun, shoot. Three shots. I know. I'm a little slow today. <laughs> All right, so three lattes, three mochas, double chocolate chip muffin, and three shots, no assassinations. <laughs> oh, and three Paul McCartney CDs. That's going to be 6812. All right, so that's just a I thought that was a pretty funny clip, and I, I laugh every time I watch it uh, um, about sometimes how miscommunication can happen. So um, as much as that poor guy was uh, was trying uh, to get the point, he kept uh, kept missing it. And um, you know, and I've been involved in a number of different um, communication missteps that uh, we have learned some valuable lessons with. So you know, we can't overemphasize the importance of of uh, developing good communication skills. And so. And sometimes, despite our best effort, when we're trying to hear what's go what the point is, we uh, we we can miss the boat. Um, so a few, I think, important lessons um, from communications that we all need to kind of pay attention to, and uh, that's uh, perspective taking. So being able to understand someone else's perspective, where they're at, maybe what blind spots they have, and being able to kind of see their um, their their position. Um, as much as I would like to say that um, that myself or, or social workers in general are good listeners, um, I've watched many interactions or been part of many interactions where you know listening is kind of in short order, and uh, so it's something that I need to make sure I remind myself of, and I think we need to kind of constantly remind ourselves that uh, that we need to be much better listeners than talkers, and that um, you know we can't overemphasize how much. Um, you know, we need to stop and listen to people's perspectives and, and uh, people's perceptions and, um, you know, and how um, valuable that is. And so sometimes we, you know, our first inclination is to think what we have to say next. And so we forget to listen to others. And so, um, you know, something we always need to kind of remind ourselves of on a regular basis. Um, and kind of along with that is asking follow up questions. So, you know, probing to really understand someone's position. So instead of trying to Kind of talk to people about what our position is, taking time to ask them questions and and fully understand their position, and that might uh, help inform us too, help us inform inform us of of why they're thinking that way, how they're thinking that way, and what um you know kind of what uh, where they're coming from as far as that goes. Um, seeking to understand what's most important to the other person. So whenever we look at um, you know the idea of compromise or or kind of coming up with a common solution. You know, we, we need to not only understand what's most important to us, but we need to mo understand what's most important to others. And so um, being able to kind of pick through what maybe are some of the side arguments or side um, discussions and really kind of hone in on what's most important in, in someone's position or someone's understanding of things. And lastly, um, I think a good, good reminder for us is thinking the best in people. 
So oftentimes when people um, think differently than us or we, they have a different perspective, um, we could easily attribute um, kind of ill will to, the, to, their, to their way of thinking. And um, so we need to make sure that we're thinking the best in folks um, all the time and that um, you know, we give people the benefit of the doubt and uh, you know, it can go a long way to building those teams. And again, when we look at things from a servant leadership model, you know, it's really about building you know, healthy communities. And so um, we can't do that if we're not thinking the best of folks and that, um, you know, that when we run into people that have different opinions or different thoughts, we need to make sure that, um, that we're giving the people the benefit of the doubt in their thinking. Okay, oh, there we go. So let's talk about delegation here a bit, because um, I think it's an important thing. And again, as I, as I um, shared with you earlier, that this is a skill that, um, that I'm trying to work with myself here. And that um, this quote I came across and I wanted to share it with you all, uh, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. So um, that really kind of became, became my mantra. And that um, you know, delegation is really about kind of finding out how to get others involved in your mission. And so again, from a leadership standpoint, the, the more people you can get involved in the work you're doing, you know, the more effective you can delegate and the more things that you can get done um, that you want to get done. So. Um, Oftentimes, you know, you might be in a small organization and say, who am I going to delegate to? But again, we look at kind of broadening our net and we look at people that are like-minded, maybe people, other organizations that have similar goals and that you really start kind of figuring out how to divvy up the work. Also came across this, this quote that, um, again, kind of became, uh, has become my mantra this year and that um, the, and under, you know, helped me to understand why delegation is so important. So the great leaders spend the majority of their time doing things that they are uniquely qualified to do. So we each have our our own uh, you know kind of unique skill sets, and uh, you know kind of from a strength model, we really need to be looking at what we're strongest at, what we can do best at. So um, I would challenge you to look at your schedule and look at all the things you do, and and you can ask yourself, and when I do this, I I can become convicted myself. Is that am I doing the things that I'm uniquely qualified to do, or am I doing things that that others could be doing as well, or others could be doing just as well as I can. So um, we have a lot to offer, and that um, you know part of being you know, developing our leadership skills is being able to figure out what we're uniquely qualified to do, what we what piece we bring to the puzzle here, and um, bring that best piece forward. So um, the whole idea of um, you know quality over quantity. So um, we might be doing lots of tasks, but um, going back to the you know the principal center model, we might not all put them into the into either the urgent or important category. And so can we look at some tasks that we do that um, maybe don't fit that bill? So um, in wrapping up here, I just wanted to talk about your commitment to leadership. And I, and I speak to myself in this as well. So what um, commitments are you willing to make as far as leaders go? And what commitments am I willing to make as, as far as being leader? So I would say, um, you know, these would be my challenges to you to use your skills to increase the um, effect, effectiveness of your work um, and your caring and carrying out the mission. Um, uh, for me, it's MHS, but um, the mission that you have, and you can fill in the blanks of whatever you happen to be involved with. Um, to continue to develop your leadership skills, it's certainly a worthwhile project. We, I think, are all in the process where we need to be continuing to develop ourselves to be the best selves that we can put forward. And so we need to develop our leadership skills, and that's certainly an important thing to do. Um, that we need to influence others to bring out um, their best selves. So um, when we work with our colleagues, we work with um, those around us, we need to make sure that we're bringing out not only our best selves, but helping people bring their best selves to the table as well. And lastly, to do everything that we can do to change the world for our clients and take the time to change the toilet paper roll and all the small tasks that we need to do um, to make sure that our organizations are being well run. With that, I'm going to leave it open for the last uh, 10 minutes here or so to have maybe a larger discussion, uh, to have some questions and comments. And I'd be curious about one, which of these models you feel um, resonate with you most, um, or if anybody has any experience with them or stories to share about um, your own leadership development, I, I would love to hear them. So Tyler, I'm going to turn it over to you for questions. Yeah, thanks so yeah, much, thanks Chris. So much. Um, I just want to remind everybody if you have any questions, Go ahead and post those in the questions section, and uh, we'll try to get to get to those. Uh, we have time here at the end now. 
And I also just want to let everybody know uh, we did have a few people ask about handouts for this presentation. Um, Chris is going to let us uh, let me go ahead and send out the PowerPoint. So I am going to um, send that out in a follow up email later today. So just uh, be patient with me and I'll get that to everybody as well. So you'll have the handouts to reference later. Um, as you were going through the presentation, Chris, I thought that was just really interesting. And as we're waiting for questions to come in, if anybody has those, um, I thought it was interesting, the different models. And I, I was just like thinking, you know, is it, do you think in your opinion that it's important for certain people to focus on certain types of leadership more than others based on like the personality or just kind of what comes more naturally to them? Yeah, actually, that's a, a great question, Tyler, because I, I um, you know, I think sometimes we have this perceived notion of what a leader is. And so oftentimes we have this 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 idea that it's a charismatic person that needs to be in front of everybody all the times. And um, I really would uh, you know, encourage folks to really expand their, um, you know, their idea of what uh, what a good leader is. And when I talk about leadership, I'm not always talking about kind of the CEO, the CFO of an organization, but it's the leadership in our groups, the leadership in our teams, the leadership that we have with our clients. So really, it's the it's the small L that 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 I really think um, that we could be focusing on, and and as you said, bringing out kind of your leadership skills uniquely qualified um, will not be what makes somebody else. And so when we're able to leverage that, when we're able to see ourselves as leaders and see ourselves as being able to bring you know a, a unique kind of quality and skill to the to the situation. Um, you know, then we're kind of using our leadership skills. And so there's no one way to go about doing that. Um, Marcus uh, Buckingham, I saw uh, him speak once on leadership and, and you know, that's exactly what his point was as well. And I, I really appreciate the way he put it. He's good because he, he interviewed um, what uh, kind of the, the industry identified as great leaders. And he asked him, what makes, you know, what makes your leadership style so qualified? And um, each of them had their own little kind of pet project or pet way to kind of look at their leadership. And, um, and is what he really kind of tied together is that is that leadership is really being able to unique to leverage your unique skills, um, and um, you know that was so important to me because you know the, as what he said is that you know if someone else tried to do what the other leader did, it would fail miserably because it wouldn't be theirs. They wouldn't feel kind of invested in it. They wouldn't be able to take some ownership of it. So it didn't really matter what they were doing, but it's a matter of kind of how they were going about doing it, and, and it was important to them, and they would convey that importance to their team. And so even though that the uh, styles were, were vastly different is what they had in common was that, um, you know, people was able to leverage their own skills, their own leadership style to, uh, you know, to get the point across. And that, that's what made them great leaders, not necessarily what they did, but it's how they did it. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of uh, people writing in just with positive feedback. And so thank you, everybody, for, you know, the kind words. And, and Chris, thank you again. Uh, for you know, coming and presenting and everything. Very, everybody's saying it's very informative, presented well. So, thanks again. Um, I also, you know, we had a couple questions here. So, and some feedback. Uh, I enjoyed the concept of a leader consistently doing the things that they are uniquely qualified to do. When one typically thinks of a leader, they think of the same qualities and emulating those certain qualities. So that's kind of just piggybacking off what you already said, Chris. Just that idea that you should be focusing on you know, the things that you're good at and you're, you're passionate about. Um, all, you know, somebody else saying all models have something valuable uh, that they would recognize and adopt, but servant leadership spoke the loudest to them. Um, all, all three models seem important to work with. Do the authors present them as complementary or independent? How do you work with all three? I think you spoke a little bit on that, but do you have anything to add? Yeah, that's interesting. And, and um, you know, I've been to, to seminars in all three of these areas and um, I've never seen them kind of side, side by side. So that's one of the things I wanted to do is really just put them kind of alongside each other to um, you know, take a, and take, you know, take the best of, of, of all three of them. So because I think they all they all have something to contribute. Um, I think they're all fairly um, unique in the way that they kind of present themselves. But I think we can take, um, you know, lessons from all three of those. And so. Um, so my hope would be that, um, you know, that you would, you know, you'd probably find a model that kind of fits best with you. And there's a lot of other models out there, but also, um, you know, you take what you, you know, you're taking what you can get of each one and incorporate that into your practice. The 10 traits of the servant leadership that you showed, um, somebody is saying is everything about being a social worker. They think, you know, it's necessary to be effective, which I totally agree with. As you're reading those traits, I was thinking, 
yeah, this is, you know, this is social work one-on-one right here. So very cool. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, one person asked uh, for qualities of companies who receive quality ratings with regard to leadership. So I think they're asking, you know, what are some, some leadership qualities that uh, successful companies have? I may be uh, interpreting that wrong, but any input on that? Yeah, you know, one book that I uh, did not put on the um, on the list there, and I'll send this out, to Tyler. We haven't gotten there yet, too. I'll share some books that are that are, that have been meaningful to me through the years. One of the things I don't actually, I'll put this on before I send it to Tyler. But uh, it's a book that's real simple. It's got a, a, kind of a funny title, and it's um it's called um, If Div Disney Ran Your Hospital, I think, or your organization. And um, there was some real practical stuff. And actually, I took my team, and we actually went month by month, and kind of took some of the principles out of there and um, really looked at Disney's model. And so when you look at kind of customer service, um, you know, there, there's, there, you know, Disney is really the, the, uh, the gold standard as far as that goes. And one of the things in the book that was kind of uh, meaningful to me is that uh, you know, the Orlando Police Department kind of adopted it as well. And you, know, you oftentimes don't think about things like police departments being particularly interested or um, uh, caring a lot about customer service. But um, you know, the, uh, the sergeant, the person that they interviewed said, you know what? Customer service is just as important to us as it is to Disney or you know, entertainment or, or other things, and that we really need to you know, develop customer service. And so, oftentimes your interaction with police isn't always that great. You know, so you're getting a ticket, you're you know, you're, you're in an accident, whatever the situation may be. And um, so, kind of even putting that aside, you know, if it can be done professional, if it can be done with good customer service, if it can be done to, to you know, keep the integrity of the folks that you have to ticket, um, you know, that was important to the Orlando Police Department. And um, you know, there's something we can all take from that. So, um, you know, so you know, I would encourage you to read that book. I would encourage you to look at your organization. You know, what would what if, what would how would Disney run your organization differently? And how would they become you know hyper focused on the customer experience that um, you know, that Disney's so known for? Yeah, this question I found very interesting. Uh, suggestions for inspiring or motivating others as a leader, especially when morale is particularly low. That can happen, actually. You know what? Yeah, morale can get low, and for a number of different reasons. And um, and sometimes, if you stand up there and you're the cheerleader, you might, uh, you know, you might get the eggs thrown at you. So um, I would say, kind of build small. Um, you know, you know, you can't go from you know from bad morale to you know, to great team leaders um, in, a, in a overnight. So I would look at kind of small ways to start building your team, to start um, looking at maybe implementing some strategies. You know, finding some. What, what I often call low-hanging fruit, so things that maybe you can kind of find as a win. Um, you're finding some uh, some effective teaming um, activities that you can do that um, that might start building some of that trust you need because morale really becomes an issue of trust. You know, people aren't listening to me, people aren't hearing me, the people don't know how hard my job is. Um, so all those things can be very um, you know kind of um, just deflating and and disheartening. And they can make us just go through our practice without um, you know, kind of keeping that passion we, we once had. And so and it's also contagious. So um, I would say start small and, and see what uh, if you can build some small wins with your, with your team. Yeah. And even going back to the communication you know, portion of your presentation, it seems like communication is so huge for to have good morale in an office place. Absolutely. Uh, any thoughts on how a social worker can lead oneself into sole proprietor business model? maybe like a private practice or something like that? That's an interesting question. Yeah, you know, I, I imagine that um, I'm, I'm not a, uh, in a sole practice, but I imagine that could be a fairly lonely um, place to be where you're kind of working on your own and um, and uh, you don't have your colleagues to, to work with. So um, so I think, and it would be easy to get, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, isolated from the rest of the profession and feel kind of isolated from, from others. So. One is I would encourage you to reach out to others to you know to look for networks um, you know through NESW or other professional associations I think are a good way to kind of keep fresh. I think the other thing is um, you know developing your own personal vision and making sure that's communicated with you with your clients and um, you know with your payer sources and that you know people know what you stand for know um, what your expertise is and um, you know and building around that so you know presenting at an NESW conference presenting at a um, at a professional association doing a a webinar like this here would be a great way to kind of get some some feedback and uh, you know, to work with others and uh, you know, to build your brand. 
Awesome. Yeah, we have just a couple minutes left, so I, uh, you know, we'll try to get to one or two more questions if we can. Apologize to the people that maybe we don't get to their, their questions. Uh, there are a lot coming in, but um, so what about um, this person's asking specifically about uh, working uh, with or leading interdisciplinary teams? Which of the models, the leadership models, do you think would lend itself better to an interdisciplinary team? Uh, that's a great question, and actually, I do an ethics training on interdisciplinary collaboration because I think that's so important and and being able to understand um, ethical codes. In fact, I'm going to be in Friday in the uh, the North Central Division presenting this on this very topic. So, um, uh, real shortly with that, since we don't have a lot of time, I would refer you to um, uh, Bronstein. What um, blank on her first name? Uh, Laura Bronstein um, actually has a survey for interdisciplinary collaboration, and and again, I did it within my own organization. I work in a very interdisciplinary kind of setting, and um, you know, found it to be very enlightening. And and we looked at kind of that that model. So there's a, a survey. Uh, I think it's called interdisciplinary collaboration. I'll try to include that link as well. And um, you know, it can be important to look to work you know across uh, across departments, across divisions, across uh, um, disciplines. In that. Awesome. And along with that, um, that reference you just made, you know, we'll, we'll be sending out again, we'll be sending out these slides a little bit later today with a follow up email so you guys can see, you know, all of this and, um, and these, I think you have some references at the end of your PowerPoint, too, right, Chris? I, I do. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. That right now. So these would be some books I would recommend. Um, again, I'll add the, um, I'll add those other two references we talked about. Very cool. Okay, great. Well, I'll get that from you and send it out then. So you guys will have that. Um, we are hovering right around 1, 1 p.m. here, so we'll probably wrap it up. Uh, thanks again to Chris for taking the time out of your schedule. Um, and just so everybody knows, these webinars are, are volunteer-based, so Chris is doing this purely out of the goodness of his heart and uh, maybe a little bit of practice for himself for <laughs> presentation and stuff. But uh, we definitely appreciate you taking the time to be here with us and, and for uh, you know, teaching. We have a lot of positive feedback coming in. Um, from people. So thank you, Chris. Absolutely. Thank you, Tyler. Couldn't have done this without you here. I tell you, you make it, you make it easy. <laughs> no problem. And, and thank you, everybody that joined us as well. We will be having another um, Lunch and Learn style webinar next month um, for the month of February. So keep your eyes on the webinars page and we'll have registration links coming soon. So we hope to see you guys then and I uh, hope everybody has a great day. Thanks again, Chris. All right, thank you. Last words I have is uh, it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. And our clients are counting on us. So um, we need to be the best uh, leaders we can be out there. So thanks so much for this opportunity.